Welcome to the hottest real estate topics on the planet, keeping you up to date with all the creative ways to buy and sell real estate without bank qualifying, so anyone can build real income starting today. Here is another great show with Dealmaker Bill and Pete the Rookie. All right, here we are at another episode of Flipping Houses for Rookies. Good morning, Bill. Here we are again, Pita Pita. And good morning, all rookies, rookettes. There you go. Semi pros, pros. There you go. Stripes, <laughs> no stripes. Yeah. <laughs> Episode no clue, number. Some clue. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Episode number 253. How to use your real estate seller's motivation to close deals genuinely. Mm. How to use real estate sellers' motivation to close deals genuinely. Mm -hmm. The sole job of real estate entrepreneurs, Peter, is to find out what is needed and wanted from every seller and then how that motivates the transaction. It's like, once you learn that, there's nothing else to learn. Okay? You That's make it a, sound easy. <laughs> that seems to be the guru mantra. Mantra is like beating the drums, right? It's what they all say. Mm -hmm. That This seems to be the guru mantra that everyone says to do. But the question I pose to you today is, how do you do this? And if you don't know how, it could be like the cereal aisle in the grocery store to a three-year-old. <laughs> so much to choose from, it makes the process of embracing a decision very hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Better question is, how do you create value for your seller almost instantly? I'm talking about the type of value that kicks out all the other players or offers. Like they have some kind of disease. <laughs> In this single podcast, you will learn how... Uh, I'm sorry, give that to you again. In this single podcast, you will learn not only how to gain this skill but how to keep the seller from, con from being confused or getting confused and engaging with you on what you propose. Hmm. In other words, goodbye ghosting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. from sellers after your first conversation. Which, by the way, ghosting means that you talk to them one time you agree to talk to them again, and they just disappear. They don't respond at all. They don't text back. They don't call you. Nothing. They just disappear. Right? Mm -hmm. You just don't know the rules of engagement until now. Just listen up, and you will get all of it right here today. Cool. Mm. I'm excited cool. about this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me do some of my housekeeping stuff like I always have to do. So uh, we record this podcast every Thursday morning, 9.30 a.m. When we do, we live stream it on Facebook and YouTube. If you would like to join us live and ask questions, you can go into Facebook or YouTube, uh, 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, if you can. I know that people listen to us all over the world. Uh, if you can make it go right to be there, then I love the questions. There's a big screen in front of me. When you ask questions, I make sure that I answer them. Okay. Plus, all the other podcasts are there. There's a, there's a whole uh, library of podcasts that we've done by video. If you prefer to watch us instead of listen to us, that, uh, that would be a better place for you. Okay? Gee, Bill, why would anybody want to watch us? I know. I know, <laughs> Peter. A couple old guys talking about real estate. In any event, uh, we also have put in your description of wherever you're listening to us or, or watching us in the description is a link 
that link used to be for free stuff. Uh, we used to give away a bunch of free stuff, 20 something free stuff things. Uh, we still give them away. You just need to go to flippinghousesforrookies.com, top right hand side, hit free stuff, uh, and you can still get that. But what's happened is, is this, the podcast is now, we've shortened it down from a 90 minute podcast down to about 45 minutes and soon to be probably less than that. Uh, so there might be times where you have questions. If you don't want to go to flippinghousesforrookies.com uh, and click on the support ticket and send me a support ticket, you can click on the link in the description and actually do a one-on-one -on -one interview with me for free for 45 minutes. It's not a selling interview. Uh, I will talk about whatever you want to talk about. Of course, if you do want to ask about coaching or, or any one of my courses, I will gladly explain them, but that's not my intention. Um, but to get that appointment, you're going to have to answer a few questions uh, about the podcast because I want your opinion and feedback about what we do for the podcast. So uh, I guess you could say you're paying for the free 45-minute intro because you have to answer some questions. So go ahead, click on that link, make an appointment with me, uh, once you finish the questions and hit submit, my calendar will show up and you can make an appointment. It is a Zoom call, so it doesn't matter where you are. We're going to do it on Zoom so uh, we can see one another face to face and actually uh, handle whatever you got going on, whatever questions you have, whatever strategy you need help with, anything like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Now that's out of the way. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, wherever you're listening to us or watching us, please subscribe so that you are part of our clan. You get on the Bill's Planet. And uh, we can uh, help you out, okay? Okay, Pete. So I want to start off today's show by talking about reality TV <laughs> and why it is so <laughs> successful. Oh, that's good. That's good. It's a good angle. Why? Yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. That's a, that'd be, that, yeah, that'd be interesting. Here we go. Conflict and controversy. Okay. Basically, conflict is a series of disagreements or arguments or a clash. Mm. And controversy is when conflict is prolonged. Hmm. Especially publicly and, and heated. That's cool. Never thought of it that way. Controversy. Is the conflict that just keeps going yeah. and going and going. Yeah. Lovely. And in TV land, the law, and this is a law, conflict equals audience engagement. Mm -hmm. Realize this. TV is made from actors and actresses. Even so, if they're amateurs. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. So everything you watch on the tube is mocked up, fake, and is not real. It was pre-prodded, written, and edited to get your attention. <clears throat> Even the news does this. After all, they do have teleprompters, right? Yeah, and you can hear the same story and all the different channels all over the country, the same words, like the exact. <clears throat> they're not even investigating or giving their opinions. They're just, re they're just acting. Right. So let me give you two quick examples of this. Not that I have this mm -hmm. written down, but I want to give you two examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I watch some reality TV show. You know, I'm an I'm a, I'm a old hillbilly at heart. You know, I watch things like Swamp People, you know, where they catch the alligators and one of my favorite shows, and I will tell you the reason why, one of my favorite shows on television, other than, you know, the Titans of America, you know, the history of how, you know, like Rockefeller and Ford and all that, I love that on the History Channel. But mm -hmm. behind that is Airplane Repo Guy. <laughs> Wait a minute, Airplane Repo, I think I missed that one. So he's a, So this is a series about guys that re, repossess millionaire toys that don't pay for them. Uh. So they repossess airplanes and helicopters and big yachts. That's hysterical. The reason, my wife asked me why I like the show. I mean, I, th I find it fascinating that they do this. But the reason why I like the show is because they don't hide the fact that there's a cameraman. So they'll be like, put your damn camera down and help me push this plane out. We got to get out of here. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so it has 
it's not so much scripted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I'm sure there's edited parts to it, but it's real. Well, I can't imagine somebody, millionaire or not, who's having somebody repossessed would calmly st stand there while it's being yanked away. Says, "Wait a minute, can you read? Can you say that again?" Exactly. He'd be screaming. He'd exactly. be screaming. Hell no! Give me my plane. Now let's take an opposite opposite syndrome. Okay. Uh, naked and afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here you have these supposedly two people, a man and a woman, that are naked in the wilderness without food. Mm -hmm. What's the cameraman eating? <laughs> oh, they let him eat. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so the cameraman has a camp and a fire and, and has all the necessities he needs or she needs. <laughs> the person, the sound, because there's going to be a sound person, a light person, a camera person. What are yeah. they doing? Yeah. Okay. So it's not this, this like they're in the wilderness by themselves like they make you think. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's my rendition. Off on a little tangent there, but okay. Now, you get the idea, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So, so what makes television, television, in other words, what gets ratings? Mm -hmm. Conflict equals audience engagement. Any hit show has conflict. Yeah. Okay. Now, today, I want to talk about engaging an audience. And I'm talking about your seller and their posse. Because every seller has a posse. Mm. You know, their lawyer their opinion leader, their brother-in-law. And, and by the way, the posse is just like Wild Wild West when somebody's going to go jump on their horse and go chase the bad guy. It's the barber. It's the, 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 the butcher, the blacksmith. They're not good at chasing. They're not posse trained. They're just pissed yeah. off and they're trained at chasing the bad guy. So yeah. your seller's posse is the same way. They're not trained. They're just there in the name of giving their opinion to help their friend or family member. Okay, so just realize there's always a posse with every seller, right? And they got opinions, don't they? <clears throat> yeah, and they blow up deals. Yeah. Okay, so now today I want to talk about engaging an audience, and I'm talking about your seller and their posse, with a non-passive, aggressive conflict like on TV. Mm -hmm. See, TV is very passive-aggressive but mm. still get the same effect of engagements that the movie stars get. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the first point I would like to make. You want the set, uh, you want to set and control the narrative for the transaction quickly. So uh, what is a narrative, right? So a narrative is a spoken or written method of connecting events together. Mm -hmm. Almost like a story with a plot or having the main event of the deal devised for a set outcome. Mm -hmm. So it's predetermined, pre-planned and thought of before it happens and orchestrated right. that way. Okay. And the so we have to be in control of the conversation, not let the owner... No, no, it's not so much the conversation, it's the thought process. The narrative is the thought process. It's like, what mm. do you believe? So let me give you an example. We yeah. want to do a terms deal. So the mm -hmm. narrative is we'll give you monthly payments until we can pay you off. Mm -hmm. So the narrative of the entire conversation and the transaction and everything that's going to go on is going to be based on that plot. Right? So the price of the house, the monthly payments, and the term is all going to be devised around that narrative, that that's mm -hmm. what we're going to do. That's the story we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to keep coming back to. That's all the objections and stalls and resistance and all the feedback. And that's the, that's the story they need to tell their posse. It's the, it's the belief system we need in this transaction. Okay. Otherwise, we don't have a transaction. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So so the narrative is the first point I want to make that we're talking about. And, and, and you want to set and control the narrative for the transaction quickly. 
which is why when we do our scripts and, and, and I say the opening call is <clears throat> when you figure out if they're willing to take monthly payments until you can pay them off or take a discount of some sort. You're going to follow one or two of the narratives. Like, mm -hmm. So if they say they want to take a discount, now you're going to go into what kind of a discount. And then we talk about cost to sell and all that kind of stuff because we want to find out how much of a discount they're going to take. We're not talking about monthly payments anymore. The narrative is different. Mm -hmm. It's a different conversation. Right. It's a different story with a different plot and a different ending. Yeah. Right? Yep. Does that make sense? Sure does. And the only way you will stand out in your seller's mind is to establish and maintain your narrative, which should ideally include conflict. So the narrative needs conflict. Hmm. Okay. And conflict will allow you to control the narrative and keep your seller curious. So let me explain. Hmm. Yeah, because that sounds a little bit like negative. You, you like you don't want you don't want conflict. You don't want the guy being upset about things. Let so, me explain. Yeah. Let me explain. Explain how you would do this. Positively. What I what I'm referring to is the principle of giving the seller options for thinking differently about the sale of this property. So you're mm -hmm. going to give the seller options to think differently about this transaction. See, the seller is only aware, in most cases, of either selling with a realtor or selling for sale by owner. Mm -hmm. Now, right. we bring in our conflict by showing them that these are not their only choices. Yeah. But 90%, 97% of the time, the worst way to sell the property is if you sell mm -hmm. it with a realtor or for sale by owner. So the conflict comes in with giving the option to think a different way. So and what we offer is conflicting with what they usually think with the realtor or for sale by owner. There you go. It's, and, and they go like, what? I, exactly. I, I love when somebody, like when you're selling, we have a, a rent to own, lease option type thing to sell to somebody, and they find that they can buy it on rent to own, they yeah. freak out yeah. I mean, in a good way. Because they didn't know. It conflicts with what they thought. We're going to have to rent again for a few okay. years, honey. So now listen to what you're saying. Listen to the example you're giving me, okay? Because this is important. This mm -hmm. is hugely important. The conflict controls the narrative. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means that you bring up some conflicting data mm. that they don't know about. And they want to continue to talk about it, which is the narrative you want to have anyways. Yeah. So they're not conflicting with you. You're not conflicting with them. No. You're conflicting with an idea, but you're offering them like something better in that. Like, wait a minute, that I, I could do this instead. Yeah, and it would be better. Now, and they don't they don't believe it at first, or they never right. heard it at first. So it's like, wait a minute, you sure? So it takes a little time to get them like, no, really, I can give right. you more money if, and right. you don't have to worry about, really? And they're going along. So it's like you're fighting this other enemy that they're happy about. Exactly right. Podcast done. I'm happy. <laughs> so, your okay, job, so your job as a real estate entrepreneur is to find out why the seller all of a sudden is selling now. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now listen to this. Then stretch the seller's mind with the new ideas that you can have or that you have or can propose to them on how they could sell this house differently. Mm. And then, like I said before, their mind would never reclaim its original shape. In other words, once you educate them, It'll never mm. go back to the original shape. So when it comes to selling this real estate property, they have this information you gave them, and now they're talking to their realtor about it. They're talking to their attorney about it. They're talking to their accountant yeah. about it because you stretch their mind, and it can't. It's like it's like a balloon. You blow a balloon up, and it doesn't go back to its regular shape when you let the air out, right? Yeah. It's never the same. 
right? So what matters here is you give them a choice they had not considered until now. You know what I like the way you do it? Uh, you don't say, you know, you should do this instead, or like, you know, you could do this. I like when you say to the guy, well, what if we did this and this, yeah. right? Yeah. Or really, really gently, like what if, or, or what else you do? Or yeah. what you don't, what you probably don't know is called, I've been trained, I'm, you know that I'm a professional speaker. You know that because you were trained the same way and we had no problem with standing up in front of a crowd and speaking and all that kind of stuff. But I was trained as that back in my yeah. early days. Yeah. I learned how to sell in a non-selling environment. Mm -hmm. And what I was taught is what you do is you tell stories of how you helped other people with specific situations that the audience itself might have. Mm -hmm. So I would stand up in front of a room and I would say to them, you know, uh, I once had a client and I did blah, 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 blah. And it's similar things that the audience that you're speaking to. So in other words, you match your message to your market would mm -hmm. have those type of problems. Yep. Right? Yeah. Like, for example, I might stand up and say, I had a coaching client one time, and he had this customer that wanted this much for the house, and here's how I helped him, and he bought the house. Yeah. Now, what happens when you're in an audience and you're speaking on stage, people will come up to you after you tell these stories that were nonchalant, by the way, type stories, right? They weren't mm -hmm. meant for anything other than to tell a story because stories are the best way to, to sell anything, right? Or describe anything or teach anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They come up to you at the end of the show and they say, can you do that for me? Mm -hmm. So just like what you're saying, the other way that I do it is I tell a story of someone else that's in the position they're in, that the seller's in, on how I helped them. And you've heard me do that too, because I'll, I'll either say to them, did you ever think of this? Or maybe we could do that. Or did you ever consider this could happen? Or I'll just say to them, you know, one time I had a, a, a seller that was in the same shoes you were in, and here's what I did for them. Yeah. And I tell them the story. And it automatically gravitates, it's believable, and it automatically gravitates them to, can you do that for me too? Okay. So what matters here is you give them choices they had not considered until now. This is the type of conflict I speaketh of today mm. without the drama aspect. Right? All right. Let's throw the dart right at the bullseye now, Peter. And let me show you what causes <clears throat> motivation. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you know this, but I am going to present it to you. This next part, I am speaking to you, Peter the Rookie, because I okay. know you know this. I know you've taught this, but mm -hmm. I am going to hopefully enlighten you on a subject you already know. That'd be okay. Seriously. I'm, okay. I'm serious too. So right you know, now, the last thing right, you need is, oh, I know it all. You don't tell me anything. I already know it all. Hey, right hey, now, this podcast just turned into a bunch of people listening to us, to you and I having a conversation. Okay. Okay. It's mo so here's how, here's what motivates a seller. This is the only thing that motivates a seller. So please listen to this because it's too freaking simple. And I know this because I've done this on my, in the last couple of weeks, I've done this with two clients in my private coaching. And they actually said to me, oh my God, I've been doing it wrong all this time. I actually get it now. Wow. Okay. And it took, and these are the guys that are always asking me for my sentences and how do you say this and how do you say that? And they actually mm -hmm. told me that once I explained this to them, they no longer needed to worry about that. Yeah. And here it is. What motivates a seller? It's most commonly called a ruin. Mm. 
let's break this down so you completely understand and have full clarity and will help you use this not very well known and used strategy. What is a ruin? Mm. It is when something, whether it's physical or mental, is reduced or is in a state of decay. It has the potential to collapse or actually disintegrate. So what is a ruin? It is when something, physical or mental, is reduced or is in a state of decay. It has the potential to collapse or actually disintegrate. It has the threat of loss and feels like destruction or is crashing in around the person again, physically or mentally. Does that make sense? So that is a ruin. I'm going to read it one more time because this is huge. When you get this, I don't care what kind of a salesman or negotiator, once you understand this one point and the next point I'm going to make about this, you will have the freedom to do this cleverly and quickly cool. with the right questions. Mm -hmm. So what is a ruin? It is when something physically or mentally is reduced or is in a state of decay it has the potential to collapse or actually disintegrate. It has the threat of loss and feels like destruction or is crashing in around the person, again, physically or mentally. Mm. All right, now watch this. At one point, this property, this piece of real estate made the seller happy. They mm -hmm. bought it, right? Mm -hmm. There was a feeling of pleasure and contentment. Mm -hmm. It was a good thing. It was a positive thing. It was a growth or expansion. It was a favorable part of the seller's life. And they welcomed it. They were excited about it. Right? Oh, yeah. But one day something happened and they suddenly became unhappy with this property. There was a reduction of happiness, a state of decay of the happiness, feeling pleasure about this real estate was gone. And it was disintegrated. Mm -hmm. Or there, there is now a major struggle within the seller's mind. There's a lack of harmony and affinity or liking of this property. You get what I'm talking about here? Oh, yeah. And I am here to tell you today, the sooner you can find these ruins the faster you can go into ultimate customer service mode and help your server seller become happy again. So they were happy. Let me recap. They were happy with the property. They were excited yep. to have it. Something happened. You know, they got a divorce. They lost their job. They got a transfer. I don't know. There's so many different things. They're behind on payments. They lost their job. Like I said before, and what happened was the property all of a sudden is reduced in value in their head. It's no longer what they want. Or if there's a state of decay. They're starting to see that they're making monthly payments. Like if they, if they got remarried and now they got an extra house and they're making monthly payments, there's a decay of their checkbook. Yep. Right? It, it, it's like the, what they wanted the house for is disintegrating. They no longer mm. need that thing. Hmm. You know, it's kind of like this. You haven't eaten in five days. 
and then you eat a meal. Mm -hmm. So what disintegrated? The hunger. Right after you eat your meal, you're not thinking about your next meal, are you? Hope not. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I can go another five days now. Yeah. Right? But you're happy that you got that meal. Sure. Now, if you go another day or two or three, that meal, the idea of that meal or the, the pleasure of that meal is starting to disintegrate because the hunger is taking over. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a ruin. Sure. Right? So, so the threat of loss is there and it feels like destruction. Right? Whatever's happening with this house, the situation that's making this house a problem feels like destruction. So you're, you're, you're frantically thinking about how can I reverse this dwindling spiral of destruction? Because real estate's not like one of those things where you could just walk away from. It's not like your car and you, you go to the, the dealership and buy a car and you get a loan. Mm -hmm. And then you lose your job and you're two months behind the payment and you bring the car to the dealership in the middle of the night and leave the keys in it and walk away. It's not like that. Although you're not really walking away with the car, but people do that, right? Mm -hmm. A house is not that way. Although you can walk away, but the ramifications of that house and, and the next two years of your life are going to be pure hell. Because mm. it's just not going to go away. Right? It reminds me of, of the physical, just physics alone and physical universe. It's like, once something's created like a piece of paper, it never leaves this universe. Like, you could burn it, but then you have ashes. Yep. You could bury the ashes, but they're still ashes. Mm -hmm. And they never go away. It doesn't disappear. So once you create the piece of paper, it never leaves. Mm -hmm. Houses and transactions are like that. Once you create them, they never leave. So here this person has decided that they don't want it. Or it's too much pressure for them. Or, or, or you pick out which one you want. And it becomes this taunting task in their mind of how they can get relief. Yep. Now, I want, to, I want to venture a little bit into the positive side of this because we have what we talk about all the time is need and greed. So I'm mm. talking about they need to sell. This is a relief method that I'm talking about where they ruin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will tell you greed is the same way. They want the equity. So what most people consider their equity, which by the way is profit. By the way, most people don't know how much how much profit they have because they really don't know how much their expenses are because they don't take they don't know how to calculate the cost to sell. Mm -hmm. So most people think that they have a thirty thousand dollar profit. They owe two. They owe one seventy, and the house is worth two hundred thousand. And they think, oh well, I'll just pay the realtor the five percent, and that's my only cost. It's not that yep. way. So usually, the first twelve or fifteen percent of their profit is not theirs if they sell conventionally. But they don't right. know that until after they've signed a contract and they've done all the legal stuff, and they can't really back out now. Mm -hmm. They find out weeks before a closing how much money they're really going to make because they don't ask soon enough. Because they don't know to ask. They don't know what they don't know. Right? Yep. Yep. So greed is this. I've had this house for 10 years and I've been paying, making a mortgage. It's got a savings account in there because I have equity. So I have this savings account of 30 grand. So I need, I need to go do something with that money. And I think I'm going to make 20 grand. Mm-hmm. That's where the ruin is. The ruin is with what they're going to do with the money. Right. And they're coming up with an unusual solution of selling the house to handle that ruin. Mm. Like I got to pay for my daughter's college or, you know, we want to buy a new house, a bigger house or, you know, there's so many different things. That is the devastation. That is the thing that they're trying to solve. And you need to figure out what that is before you could actually get them in communication with you and keep them going, right? I don't think you ever got that very clear. 
uh, from you before because you're always talking about the guy who needs to sell the house. And the right. greed guy always just seems like, eh, he just wants money. But as you're pointing out, like he needs it for something. I mean, I'm, right. I, if you remember a few years ago, I was talking to a woman. She needed 30000 for the husband's surgery. He was very right. ill. So right. it wasn't just, you know, for, for shits and giggles. She needed the money. So I'm going to make a very profound statement here, but I don't want to elaborate on it. So is the ruin in the deal or outside of the deal? Outside. So in in need, it's in the deal because mm. the house is in the way and they're trying to relieve themselves of it. In yeah. greed, it's outside of the deal. Something they need the money to do outside. Something outside of the deal. Okay, it's a good way to put yeah. it. Yeah. And that that's how we that's how we need to figure out which one it is. That's why we do need and greed, right? Mm. Now, I would like to bring up this point. This is my total, absolute, positive, over the rampart, stable datum. And if you think I'm good at what I do, this is the reason why. I figure out what their ruin is quickly. And when the deal starts to go sideways, I talk about the ruin again. And I reel them back in. So if we don't do this transaction, how are you going to handle Susie's college education? So if you don't accept my offer, how are you going to handle the four payments you're behind? And it reels them back in. Or they tell you what their plan B is because they've mm. manufactured a plan B in their head and at least give you the opportunity to match or beat plan B. So when I exhaust the deal, I'm confident that I just don't want that deal. Mm. Because I figured out the ruin, all the things we just talked about now, and I mm -hmm. use it to reel them back in when they start drifting away. By the way, if you're talking, if, if I'm talking to you, Peter, and we're talking about your problem and helping you solve your problem, are you going to ghost me? Not if I think you really can help me. Hell no. Because here's what happens. I'm adding value to you by bring, helping you open your mind, stretch your mind out with choices of how you could solve this problem. Yeah. I'm expanding your mind like I was talking about before, with different choices or options that you may not have thought of. Right? Hmm. And I'm bringing viable, plausible, real solutions that could possibly help you with your ruin. It's called bringing to understanding how to fix it. So you bring them to some sort of an understanding that something could be done about it. And what it does, now think about this, what it does is, is when you have a ruin or something that is devastating you, you tend to have a scarcity mentality. You only have one or two possible solutions. Mm. And you're trapped within your own mind because you're not, able to see the other choices right so yep. i know that we've talked about this so many times before you know it's like when i have a problem i, I do i do how many solutions can i come up with mm -hmm. and when i get to eight nine ten and eleven i got really creative and those are the best solutions because often the first solution is not the right solution yeah it's probably some easy way out yeah like, it's a quick I'll just fix. borrow. I'll just borrow money, or I'll just quit, or I'll just you know right. just the easy way out. The first thing that comes to mind, and never really taking in consideration. Everything okay? I got a mouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've so, never seen one. Sorry, I got a mouse came through. <laughs> okay, so so you never take in consideration the ripple effect. So you throw a pebble in the pond, and it creates a ripple. You're not on the other side of the pond to see how that ripple is affecting the other side of the pond, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So you never took that in consideration. So, so what happens is, is when you come along, the ultimate customer service is actually getting the seller to look at this problem from a different angle with different information. 
different possibilities, different choices. Mm. And if you do this correctly, one will resonate and they'll stick to you like glue because nobody else has done that for them. What would you say about really finding the person's problem? Because doesn't it have layers where uh, as uh, rookies, we might take the first thing the person complains about thinking, oh, that's it. But it could have layers where... So that's a very good point. You just you just asked a whole bunch of questions. So number one, you have to figure out, A, are they just complaining or making a comment? Mm. Or is it really a ruin? Mm. Mm. Right? Like, I don't want to live here anymore. I'm paying too much taxes. Well, mm-hmm. is it is it a problem with the taxes or is it a problem with he can't afford the taxes? Mm-hmm. Right. So you have to figure that out. And, I, and I'm trying not to be complex about it because it's really not this complex. And there was a second part to your question that you were asking that I didn't answer. Well, just like the, the layers. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so here, here's how you know that it's not superficial. Mm-hmm. They keep talking about it. Mm. Right. So if you say to them, oh, you know, well, it's taxes. And then all of a sudden they give you another objection. Well, yeah, oh, it's not yeah. Re- it's not really a taxes. It's really because you know I'm getting transferred, and they keep bouncing yeah. around. If the they keep room- changing what the thing is, it can't be it until you get right. the real one that does. Okay, right. that makes. I've heard I've heard that before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just have to remember to keep all the ducks in a row here. So here's my point: you don't need to have all these fancy fancy sentences and be a a dealologist, you know, a strategist with all the the different types of deal structuring. Mm-hmm. When you find the ruin and you actually intend to help them, you will learn too. Mm. The deal will unfold and you will learn from it too. The two of you will work at it together. That's when I say don't build a bridge from your product to the customer. You build the bridge from the customer to your product. That's what it means is you walk down the other side of the table or you went to the other side of the river and you, and you help the customer build a bridge to you or to their solution. And you go through it together. And that's where my experience comes from, is walking mm-hmm. across that bridge multiple times with multiple people with multiple solutions. And you don't need to be a know-it-all. That's a false datum. Right. Right? I mean, the last thing I'm going to say, and then we're going to end off, is I want you to know that I started this podcast off and then rewrote it because I wrote it out of ang- I was going to write it out of anger because I was pissed really? off like a mother effer. I and you know me, I don't get I mean I don't I mean I I rant, but I don't really get mad. Mhm. And I was in my networking meeting and the banker is telling people that they when they when they in today's environment because it's so much competition You need professionals on your side. Mm -hmm. And he named Mm -hmm. the attorney. He named (laughs) he named the realtor and he named himself. The mafia. Right? Which made me think we need to do another podcast because the original podcast we did was episode ninety. Don't deal with the real estate mafia. We're gonna do another one of those pretty soon because I want to do a new version of it. Mm-hmm. But the point is, okay. the point is, is that he is entrenched in, in, in myths and disbelief. The only pro in that room to do this was me. Mm. And he didn't even recognize me because I could go into a house and do all the things that I'm talking about right now. Because here's the thing. Most people, when they're selling a house, don't need money. Money's down on the list. Of course, they want their money. But that's mm-hmm. not the number one reason for selling. Mm-hmm. Everybody doesn't want money. Right. They want the money to solve some of the problem. They want the problem to go away, but the money is just the, 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 the route or the conduit to get to solve the problem. Yeah. So what I'm saying well, is, is I'm arrogant enough to say that I could do a much better job than a realtor and a, and a banker because, first of all, they're working on multiple deals, which is fine. But more mm-hmm. importantly... They they don't even know they're entrenched in a system that doesn't solve everybody's problems. Yeah. 
it's a one size fits all. Yeah, but do they care? They don't because they just go <laughs> by vinyl. I'm sorry. Which if if we go if we if we go into the into the real estate mafia, the only reason why they're there is to get their fees. The banker that was speaking, the only reason why he would do a transaction is to get his commission. Mm -hmm. I go in houses and I know that I can't buy every single house. I do a presentation and every time I walk away, I know I have delivered abundance to that person. They remember me. I, as I talked about in episode number 251, I talked about stretching their mind with choices. Yep. And it doesn't ever go back, like we just talked about a few minutes ago. Their mind never mm -hmm. goes back to its original state after I leave them. Because I, I open their mind yep. up to other ways that this could be done. Now, maybe it's not what they want to do. Maybe they feel it's uncomfortable. And a lot of them feel like because they don't have never heard of it before, and it's not the narrative yeah. they, of the herd. Trust it? Yeah, it's not the narrative of the herd. They don't trust it. Yeah. Okay? You're outnumbered. Yeah. So... Yeah. So in final, it isn't the investor's training on deal structuring or memorizing magical sentences like most would think. It is knowing how to find the ruin and then pose the exact solution with a desired narrative and specific result for the seller. And that's the magic of creative real estate investing. Nice one. Please give us a review. Go to either go to <laughs> Flipping Houses for Rookies and tech, uh, click on testimonial. Please leave us a testimonial. I'm trying to hit over 100. We're close on that page. Uh, please subscribe to us if you're listening to us on a podcast channel or in Facebook or in, in, uh, in uh, YouTube. Make sure you click on the link in the description and uh, help me with feedback. Give me some uh, questions to a couple, uh, I mean, give me answers to a couple questions I've, I've, I've asked you uh, because I'm really trying to, to tune this podcast up so that you get the most out of it. Uh, because believe me, uh, I don't need to do this every week and neither does Peter. We have other things to do. We're here to help you. So it, we wanna do the right things. We're not here just to hear ourselves talk. The 253 episodes, we've heard ourselves talk, we're good. We mm -hmm. want to help you. We want to, we want to stretch your mind and help you think independently and better. Okay. So please go fill that survey out. And if you so desire, get a one-on-one -on -one interview with me where we spend 45 minutes on a zoom call and I go over whatever you want to talk about. And it's not me trying to sell you anything. We could talk about that, but it's not intended to do that. Okay. And lastly, tell your friends about us. You know, email somebody and let them know that we're here if they're interested in real estate, creative real estate investing. Okay. With that said, have a great week and we'll talk to you next Thursday. Over and out. Thanks for tuning in to the hottest real estate topics on the planet with Bill and Pete. If you want to continue learning how to buy and sell real estate without money or credit, head over to FlippingHouses.club for some cutting-edge real estate wealth tools. Or contact us at info at FlippingHouses.club.